sorry about that. Uh, I had to help out with kids because we didn't have any volunteers, and so I apologize for being late. It's kind of crazy right now. So didn't have any. There's no volunteers. Thanks, John, for getting that. We didn't have any production guys today. So yeah, so it's one of those, one of those deals. You know, what do you do when you don't have volunteers? You know, you just have to get it done. I want to say hello to all of our campuses right now. Uh, sorry, I was a little late. I, I was helping out with the nursery because we didn't have any volunteers there. So, you know, this is actually no-show weekend. We wanted to give you a taste of what it's like if we didn't have volunteers at any of our campuses. And so, you know, many people actually said to me today, they said they came in and just felt so dead. In fact, people actually said to me, they said, honestly, Pastor, I thought I was walking into a funeral. It was so quiet. And you know what? When you don't have volunteers in a church, that means the church is dead. But with volunteers, it's alive. It really is. It becomes alive with volunteers. Forgive me, I don't have my shoes. I gave them away, so I don't have any shoes right now. Maybe you did the same thing, so I got my booties on, so it's all good. But uh, so glad you guys are here today. Take out your notes if you would at all of our campuses. I want to say hello to all the campuses. Thanks for being a part of our services today. And uh, I'm going to dive right in now as we talk about no show weekend, what it looks like when no one shows up. No one shows up in the parking lot. No one shows up to greet. No one shows up to hand you a bulletin. If you didn't get a bulletin, you're on your own, buddy. You got to go out there and get it yourself. It's sitting out on the table because there's no one there to hand it to you. If you, you know, maybe you noticed that there was no, no, no snacks out there. There's no one to do any of that stuff. The production, you just got plain lights. Why? Because there's no one's here to do any of that stuff. And that's what church looks like when no one shows. But when people show up, wow, it's unbelievable around here when people are showing up and serving and making a difference. And if this is your first time, you got to come back because you're not even going to believe what it's really like if you come back next week, right? Yeah. It's awesome around here because of our volunteers. Volunteers are game changers. They really are. I want to show you some scripture today. I guess I should take this off. I'm going to forget. Otherwise, I'm so... I preached like half the sermon last week, uh, last message with this. I totally forgot that it was on. So let me... Get to this. Okay, there we go. All right, there you go. Hey, congratulations. <laughs> we're a giving church. You can have that. There you go. Okay, so, all right. So we're talking about no-show weekend, and so the thing is, is that we need to begin to serve and to show up and to make a difference because volunteers really are the difference maker. And so, you know, I remember years ago, our church, we used to meet in a school because we didn't have the resources to have the buildings that we have today. And so, believe it or not, we didn't always have this. If you're, If you showed up Maybe at our church when we already had this, it's easy just to assume it's always here, but it wasn't. When my wife and I moved to town, it was just, it was just the two of us. Our one child at the time was six weeks old, didn't know a single person here, and just by God's grace and God's goodness, all the stuff you see now is here because so many people volunteered, served, and gave, and sacrificed, and now there's this wonderful church that's here because of you, because of the, the sacrifice that you have made. But years ago, yeah, isn't it great? All the things God's done, I stand amazed, I really do. Years ago, we used to meet at Ella Barnes Elementary School. It's an elementary school here in our city. And that was our first kind of our semi-permanent home. We'd meet there on Sundays. So here's what we did. We, we had a trailer that we borrowed. It was a flatbed trailer. And we'd load it up. And I would pull it myself at first until eventually we had some other, some other guys. And so I had this old forerunner. And I would pull that trailer. could barely pull it. But it was full of chairs sound equipment, children's equipment, and we'd unload this every single weekend to have church. So Friday or Saturday night, I'd show up with maybe 10 other guys, and we'd show up and we'd set up the entire uh, school for church, right? Because we had, we had to bring, bring in our own chairs because in an elementary school, all the chairs were too small, so I didn't want to see a big guy sitting in this little small chair. It would be kind of awkward, so we had to buy the chairs, so we had these, these folding chairs, and so we'd move them in and move them out. It was just, it was like this crazy thing. In fact, my, my son Mason, he hardly remembers it now, but he used to be, sit in a little bouncer, a little bouncy, while we'd be moving chairs in and out. I mean, it was crazy. That's how the, uh, my kids grew up, you know, seeing all that, so that's kind of how we did it. But so basically, we were setting up and breaking down chairs constantly. So because of that, we would literally set up Friday or Saturday night and Sunday after church, we'd, we'd be setting up, I mean, we'd be breaking down everything and getting the place back to normal and loading up the trailer till like two or three in the afternoon every single Sunday. It was exhausting. We did this for three years. And let me tell you, that was a long three years. We just set up and break down every single week. It was crazy, right? And so here's the thing. One of, one of my buddies that was coming to our church at the time, he said, uh, he said, hey, pastor, you know, this is really hard for us to be moving two and three chairs at a time on either hand. He goes, well, wouldn't it be better if we could move a bunch at one time? I said, that'd be great. I don't know how to do that. He said, well, come by my house. I built something. I want to see if you like it. So I showed up at his house, and his name was Alan Teague. He's a great guy. Uh, he, he, in this garage, he showed me this huge chair rack that he had built. 
uh, just out of wood. He built it himself. It could hold 36 chairs at one time. He said, now, let me put the chairs in here. Now, check this out. Then you lift up one end, and you slide these caster rollers underneath, and now you can roll this thing up to the trailer and load it that way. It was a game changer for us. So he basically, once, it, once he found out that I was, like, cool with it, then he built, you know, six or seven of them, and we used them, and it was how we got the chairs in and out. It was great. But still, it was hard work. The only thing is, now you have to load these chairs up. Now, imagine lifting this thing with 36 chairs on it. I mean, it's very, very heavy at this point. So you'd have to have three or four guys all around it to lift it up to get the casters on it. Then we'd roll it, okay, and we'd get all the way to the trailer outside, and the trailer was, was higher than the curve. And so then we had to get all these guys around it and lift this thing up and set it on the edge of the trailer and get it the other end and lift it up and then shove it onto the trailer. And we did this every single week. It was exhausting. This thing was so heavy, by the way, you'd have to have three or four guys to do it. One time there was one guy, and he was a real muscular guy, but he was holding it, and he thought he had it. And so one of the guys let go of his end, and he was just holding it, and it ripped his muscle, and it coiled his muscle up in his arm. He had to have surgery that next week. It was sick, gross, horrible. We felt so bad for him. He got it fixed. I thought, okay, if he's that muscular and it happens to him, I don't ever want to try that. I mean, I can only imagine. <laughs> I would hurt myself bad, right? And so basically we had to load these things all the time. So about two and a half years in, we're at Grant Middle School now, which is right over here, right? We're at Grant Middle School uh, because we moved because they had better parking and it was a little bit bigger, and, and so we're, we're there now. We're still bringing in our own chairs, though, because they didn't have chairs there, so we're bringing those in, and so we're there, and I'll never forget, we're, we're, we're loading these chairs, and it's crazy. This visitor comes one weekend, and we had visitors all the time that would come for the first week and just say, hey, I, I, I can help. I'll stay and, and help serve. They could just see we needed it, and I was like, oh, thank you. That'd be great. So this guy says, hey, you need some help breaking down, because I would always say at the end of the last service, if you can stay and give us 20 minutes, and when, when, when 30, 40 people stayed, we'd break everything down, and literally we'd be out of there in about 30 minutes. If no one stayed, it would take us two or three hours. I mean, it was crazy. So I was like, oh, it's such a game changer to have volunteers. And so this guy says, hey, you want me to help out? I got a truck. I said, that'd be great. Back your truck up next to the trailer. And we'll, because we always had extra stuff we had to load in the truck and then take it to the storage unit, pull the trailer in, store it there, and all the extra stuff, unload the truck and put it on it. And just, and then we'd get to the next week, right? So he backs his truck up and he's getting out. And just like normal, we're all loading these chairs and sitting on the edge right there. And he just walks up to the trailer. He's just walking by and casually just says it. He goes, Oh, check it out. This trailer's got a ramp underneath it. And he pulls the ramp out. We're like, oh! <laughs> Two and a half years. <laughs> there was a ramp the whole time. <laughs> so we're looking for smart volunteers. Because <laughs> we weren't. Yeah, funny for you. It was crazy. I could, I could tell you endless stories like this. I mean, it was just the craziest stuff. Oh, I, I tell you what, I didn't say this at any other service. This is just for you, right? Okay. <laughs> one time, because our people were so new in the Lord, they didn't know better. So one time, we, we got someone asked us, hey, Pastor, I, I think maybe you need to talk to your usher. I don't know if he should be collecting the offering in that shirt. And I was like, what? And I looked over, and there was a guy, who was, he was one of the ushers, and he was wearing a Budweiser t-shirt. <laughs> I was like, yeah, maybe we don't want to do that. So... But yeah, it's okay. Anyways, the point is, you know, we are a church for people that are new in the Lord and just come in here. I love that. That's great. But we don't want our ushers to be sponsored by Budweiser. That's the only thing. Is a little, you know. But the deal is, is that we love when people get involved like that because people are game changer. In fact, years ago, I remember during this time, I was talking with a pastor friend of mine and I was t getting some advice from him. He was an older guy, been in ministry for, for about 20 years. It's hard to believe now. He's, he was the age I am now. Wow. Anyways, uh, yeah, but I was just a young pup and trying to learn, and, uh, and I was talking to him, and, and I said, man, we just don't really have a lot of leaders coming to our church, and what I meant by that was leaders in our community yet, because we we're just such a new church, we didn't have a lot of that, so in my mind, leaders were like doctors, bankers, lawyers, people that own businesses, blah, 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 you know, or maybe you're leading in the military, that kind of thing, and those are leaders, no question, all those are leaders, but then he stopped me, and he corrected me, and it was great, he said, you do have leaders, they're the people that are doing setup and breakdown every weekend, and I was like, you know what, you're right. They're leaders. And I realized something at that point. I realized that that is leadership. And you know what? He was so right. And he said, that's your future board members. That's your future staff. That's your future leaders in every area. And you know what? That has become true in our, in our church. That's where the leaders come from. Or things like that. Because here's what I can tell you. Time and again, I've said this a hundred times at this church. And I'm going to say it again. It's a core value of who we are. We really believe this. People use people to get tasks done. God uses tasks to get people done. So he grows us through those experiences. So the needs of the church is actually, instead of me saying, oh, the church needs you to serve, actually, you need to serve at the church because it grows you. 
That's how you grow in your faith. That's how you grow in your understanding. That's how you begin to utilize the knowledge you have. Look at the first verse for today. Check it out. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it says this. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Now, what are the gifts? Actually, he gave people. That's the gift. Look at this. He says, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. So I am your gift. <laughs> well, you're not clapping. I don't understand. <laughs> But here's how it actually works. Don't worry, I'm not that big into myself, I promise you. I always tell my daughter, I go, you know, I'm kind of a big deal. And she's like, yeah, right, Dad. So, but check this out. The reason why he gave us to you was so that we could do what? It says their responsibility, so my responsibility, is to equip God's people, that's you, to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. So I am a gift to you to train and equip you to be a gift to the world. Does that make sense? That's how that works. So what does this mean? This means that if I am teaching you, giving you wisdom, giving you biblical instruction every single week, and you're not serving with it, then you're wasting all that I'm teaching you. See, many people think, oh, I'm mature in Christ. I'm, I'm a mature believer. I'm into discipleship. I love people that say that. And I always say, tell me what you think that means. And it'll describe Bible studies and knowledge and learning more and eventually going to seminary and things like that. And I always say, that's great. But are you obeying what you already know? Most of us are already disobeying far beyond the knowledge we already have. And so, because to think that you're mature in Christ just because you know a lot about the Bible is also to read a book on health and declare yourself healthy. You got to do it. You got to go to the gym. You got to eat right. You got to do the things you're learning in that health book instead of just knowing about what to do. You've actually got to do it. So the only way for you to grow spiritually is to begin to really serve. Otherwise, you'll hit what I call the glass ceiling. You just won't go. You like, I don't know why there's something wrong. I'm just not really growing in the Lord. I don't know why my heart isn't growing towards Christ. It's because you're not serving. But when you begin to serve, when you become unselfie, take the lens off yourself and put the lens in other people and begin to serve, that's when you grow. Here's the point. Number one, please write this down, would you? To grow up, you got to show up. To grow up, you got to show up. You want to be mature in the Lord? Serve. And I don't mean this to be ugly, but I will challenge you and get in your grill today and tell you that if you think you're spiritually mature and you're not serving, you're lying to yourself. You're not. Because God called us to be servants. God called us to make a difference in the lives of others. Where are you serving? And by the way, if you're single, I highly recommend that you serve. I would never, if I was single, which I'm far from single, but if I were, if I were single, I would never date someone that's not already serving in the local church. I'm telling you, it's a big deal. Listen, can I talk to my single ladies for a second? All the single ladies, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. Okay, I'll stop. That could get awkward. Okay. All the single ladies, listen, this is a big deal, okay? If I'm a single woman, which I'm far from that, if I was a single woman, I would never date a guy that's not already serving in the local church. Not that he starts serving when he starts dating you, because you don't know how real that is yet. Let's be honest, okay? We all know guys can talk a big game about whatever they figure out you want to hear. Come on. That's true, isn't it? All my guys are like, he's on to me. What's up with that? <laughs> it's true, right? So they need to be serving before, long before you ever meet them, okay? And so here's the deal. In fact, you know, I can't tell you the countless amount of singles that began uh, dating after they started serving here and met each other while they were serving. Boom sauce. That's the way you should do it. That's what that should look like. I'm just telling you. We should have buttons that say single and serving. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> then you can identify each other. Because it's hard in church. You're clapping and you're like, slow down. I can't see the ring. I need you to slow down. I can't. <laughs> Come on, I'm not dumb. I know what's up. You're all like, praise God. <laughs> you can always tell the singles that are working in the greeters ministry. They're going to handle the bulletins. They're like, hi, welcome to church. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Weird. But here's the deal. I would never date someone who's not serving because if they won't serve in God's house, what makes you think they're going to serve in your house? I'm just saying, it's true. We need to be servant-minded. And where do you think you learn that? You learn that in God's house. And so Jesus said over and over in the Bible, go and do likewise. What does that mean? Take what I've taught you and go do it. Go actually do it. You know how many one another's there are in the Bible? There's all kinds of one another's. Serve one another, love one another, pray for one another, encourage one another, admonish one another, warn one another. You know, we, we're not very good at all those. We're good at the other one another's. Judge one another, betray one another, talk about one another. We all know those one another's, but we need to be doing the other one another's, and you can't do that unless you're serving in God's house. Yes. 
serve one another. He wants us to serve. God wants us to sign up and to begin to serve. You know how many volunteers it takes to run this church every single weekend? Any, any guesses? Guess how many? Last weekend, we had to have 1,078 people to serve you. 1,078. And by the way, we were low. We actually need 12 to 1,300. And if we're really kicking on all cylinders, 15 to 1,600. That's when people take to serve. Don't even get me started on Christmas Eve. Don't even get me started on what it takes for Easter. Oh, my goodness, it's crazy. We need an army of people to serve to make a difference. You know, we, we, we shut down virtually every ministry this week because we wanted to show you what it looks like without people serving. The only thing we didn't shut down was children's because you don't want to know what that looks like. <laughs> that is some chaos. That would be chaos weekend. I mean, that would be insane. So we didn't even do that one. But I'm telling you right now, it is so critical. You make a huge difference when you serve. It's a big deal. Check out this next scripture. I, I want to talk about this one, Isaiah 6, verse 8. Actually, before I read it, let me just say, I was watching a movie the other day, and it's, it's a pretty good movie. I, I actually really liked it. It's called Fury. How many of you guys saw Fury? Some of you guys saw the movie. It's a really good movie. It's, it's pretty hardcore, I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's, it's tough to watch because it's about World War II, and it's very, very real. And so it's like, whew, this is brutal. But I love World War II movies. I just do. I just love that kind of stuff. Saving Private Ryan, all those, I love them. So this movie I really wanted to see. I was excited about it. It had some great actors in it. Brad Pitt, obviously a great actor. Shia LaBeouf, one of my favorite actors. He's really, really good. Can't say much about his personal lifestyle, but he's an incredible actor. And so he's a method actor. They said actually he didn't shower for three to four weeks while he was filming it because he wanted it to be that real. I was like, wow, that's crazy. Like, because they lived in this tank. They literally lived in a tank. I mean, this is very real. This is what happened during the war. And so it's really, really powerful. And I don't want to be a spoiler of the movie. So if you didn't see it, but the scene I'm going to tell you about, it's actually in the trailer, so it's okay. But I don't want to spoil it. But I mean, they were, when I found out they were all blind in the end, I was like, whoa, that's so crazy. No, I'm just kidding. I was just, just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding, they're not. It's just a joke. So here's the deal. But in this one particular scene, it's so powerful because Shia LaBeouf, play, he's a guy from Transformers, he plays the character of a guy that's like a, like a big-time Christian, and he's always quoting Scripture. In fact, Shia LaBeouf later said, this is really interesting, after the movie, he was interviewed, and he said, actually, because of the part I played, I became a Christian. I was like, wow. In fact, just a little side point, he actually said, it moved me so much. He said, like, same thing. you know, it really blew my mind. He's, he became a Christian. Guess who led him to Christ? The director and Brad Pitt. I was like, uh, okay, my mind's blown. What was that? Are you kidding me? Because Brad grew up in a Christian home. So he did know some truths there. And even though he may not live out all of those or even believe in all those anymore, he did know enough to help lead him to Christ. I was like, that's impressive to me. And so you never know who God can use. It's pretty cool. But so here's what happened. During the filming of this thing, it was such a powerful scene because they realized, and I, I will tell you this one scene, but it's not going to give away the movie. It's, it's a really good movie. I can't, I can't put my stamp on everything in the movie. I'm just being honest, okay? But it is a good movie. But at this one scene, they stay in the tank rather than leave it because, to, because this huge army's coming at them, and to stay in the tank would be to die. And they were like, we need to escape. And so they were all running out, and then Brad Pitt's character, he says, I'm not leaving. And they're all like, what? And all of a sudden, it just changes everything because he's like, I'm staying. Like, in other words, like, this is what I was meant. This is what I'm made to do. I'm not leaving this. So then Shia LaBeouf's character says, okay, I'm not either. So he gets back in, and they all get in. And at one point, Shia LaBeouf's character, he's, he's crying. He, he, he's tearing up. And he says this next verse very, very powerfully, which I think is really powerful about our, our military because we forget that they put their lives literally on the line for us every single day. <laughs> Amazing. He says this, and then Brad Pitt's character tells him the reference, and he looks at him like all shocked because he even knew it. This is what he says. He says, and also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Whoa. Basically, they, he realized God sent me here to be in this tank to give my life for your freedom and my freedom. And so it changed the way they fought the battle when they realized they were sent by God. And you and I are different people when we finally wake up to the fact that we have been sent to a lost and dying world. We have been sent by God. Now, I literally feel like I have been sent by God from Dallas, Texas, 16 and a half years ago to plant this church and to give my life to this city. I feel sent, but so are you. My prayer is that every one of you, yeah, thank you, but you're sent too. Listen, I really believe this. I, I hope and pray that every one of you, sometime in the next few years, 
move from one campus, wherever you are, whatever campus you're watching from, to another because you're sent by God to the other campus to serve, to open another campus, to start another one. You know, we have done that. We have now have all these campuses. I mean, Rodfield is so successful because over 300 people felt sent by God, sent out of this campus to go to Rodfield to open that campus. But I could say the same thing about Beeville, Alice, Padre Island, Northwest. We could go on and on with people that have been sent by God to go do another campus. When frankly, they already had a nice cush little position here. They had a nice youth group already going here. Already nice children's ministry. All these nice facilities. But no, they went to another city because they were sent by God to a worse facility and had to clean it up and get it organized and start the youth from nothing and start the children from nothing. Why? Because they're sent by God. When you live sent, it changes everything. But we have been sent by God. All of us. In fact, I believe that we should represent God. Number two, we should represent. As the rappers say, represent. We should represent. I know that was really white. I'm sorry. I'm trying. I'm like, <laughs> I'm doing what I can. So you see my wife. She's whiter than me. It's unbelievable. She's our dance. She's off. I'm like, easy Carlton. Okay. So the deal is this is that we need to understand, we're, I'm sorry, my ADD is kicking in. I'll take my medicine. I apologize. It just, it happens. It's crazy. But here's the deal. We need to live sent by God. Because when you're sent, it changes everything. It changes your passion. It changes your drive. And when you recognize, I am sent by God. When you come to church, you don't just come here to get something. You come because you're sent to give something. Instead of just saying, oh, I want to get a word from God today. What if you're called to give a word to God, from God to someone else today? Oh, I just, I want to enjoy the, the, the children's ministry. What if you're called to help others enjoy the children's ministry by serving in it? And so we need to live sent by God to make a difference in other people's lives. Look at this in Scripture. It says in Luke 14, 28, But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started the building and couldn't afford to finish it. Now, many of you say, okay, well, Pastor, I hear you, but this building is finished. By the way, we have some buildings that aren't finished. And you know the campuses I'm talking about. And if your building is not finished, then that means God is calling you to get involved to get that done. So I'm, I know I'm not talking right now to the campus I'm at, but I am talking to some campuses. And you know who you are, Northwest. You know who you are, Rockport. You know who you are, the campus, San Marcos, and the other ones that you know God's leading you to finish out that building, and I want to challenge you to do it. Don't wait on Big Daddy over here, this ministry, this campus, to pay for your way. I'm putting it on you. Do it yourself. Do it yourself. It's too easy to think, and I, I mean Big Daddy, the whole campus here, it's too easy to think, well, the, this campus should pay for what we're doing. No, no, you pay for it. We pay for this. God wants you to be involved making a difference. I want to challenge you to do that. So, okay, check this out. I want to challenge you with this first, though, because it says that wouldn't it be a shame to build a building and then not have it finished, right? But let me tell you something else about, about buildings. Wouldn't it be a shame to have a nice finished building but have no one to run it? Wouldn't that be just as shameful? Have you ever been to a big box grocery store late at night? And you got your cart full of stuff. Grocery store, maybe it's a H-E-B, Walmart, maybe it's a Home Depot, wherever, right? And something that you got it loaded up with stuff. You ever been to a store like that, and you get up there, and there's all these people that are trying to check out, and there's only one cash register open? Are you frustrated? Yeah. Me too. Now, that doesn't normally happen in those stores. They're good stores, and good people work there, and I know that. But we've all occasionally experienced it. When you go to some store, it may not be that one, maybe another one, where you get up there and there's virtually no cash register. Maybe there's only one, and you're like, man, you got to be kidding me. You ever seen someone walk off from their, ba from their basket? They're just so frustrated, they just leave it. I've seen people, please don't do that if you're from this church, because you represent. Please don't do that, okay? But at the same time, I understand that frustration. How is that any different than having this beautiful, nice facility that you're in, whatever campus you're at, and you go and someone goes to check in their baby and there's no one in the nursery? How is it any different than you go check your kids in children's church and there's one worker with 50 kids and you're like, these ratios are horrible. I'm not dropping my kid in here. How is it any different? We need to represent. We need to represent and make sure we have enough workers for that nice facility that we enjoy every week. We should be volunteering. Sign up to serve. Do me a favor right now. Would you take out this little sheet of paper? It looks like this. It's a white sheet of paper. It says volunteer sign up. Uh, pull that out, would you? I don't hear any rustling. I need you to grab this paper right now, right now, right now. Grab it, grab it, grab it. Turn to the person next to you if they're not pulling it out and say, shame on you. Go ahead and do it right now. Would you do that? There you go. Shame on you. Spit a little bit when you say it. Shame on you. Shame on you. Something like that. Yeah, that'll, that'll get their attention. They'll be like, okay, I'm filling it out. 
Pull this out. I'm sorry. Again, I don't know what's going on. I, I'm, I'm having problems today. Please fill this out. Would you do that? I want to challenge you to fill this out. In just a moment, we're going to have you actually come up and sign up. We've been walking that aisle all week, all month, haven't we? You know, the last two weeks. You know what? Let me say something crazy. The last two weeks, I've talked on tithing and sacrifice, and we've had more people get saved and higher attendance than virtually any time in our church as of late because God's moving in some of the cruddiest, uh, not cruddiest, that's the wrong word, harshest, most difficult sermons where I'm just like, boom, boom. And guess what? You know what I've discovered? God's people respond when you get in their face. You know why? Let me tell you why. Because people want what's real. And this is real. It's so real we want you to sign up. That's how real it is. I want to challenge you, even if you think the message is harsh. It's not harsh, it's truth, guys. It's truth. And you will never be all that God has for you to be until you deploy your gifts for Him. Are you serving? Don't talk about how spiritual you are in the Lord, this and Lord, that, 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 that. Don't care if you're not serving. Because that's the game changer. It's a game changer for your life. It's a game changer for your marriage. It's a game changer for your career. It changes everything if you start to serve. Oh, I'm just praying for my husband or my wife. I wish they'd just act this way and that way. If you start serving them, that'll change everything. Service is a game changer. Represent. Represent Christ in everything that you do. Can we switch camera angles? We're only using the same angle this whole time. We don't have any camera. Never mind, never mind. Switch back, switch back, switch back. There we go. Sorry. Sorry, we don't have a really good video for all the campuses right now because we don't have the volunteers for production. So, sorry. Can you imagine what it would be like if it was this way every week? When we know it's so much better. When we volunteer, when we're involved, when we're making a difference. Fill this out. In just a moment, I'm going to have you come up and I'm going to have you sign up and then take that sheet with you out to the different ministry booths. We have at all campuses, all over the campuses, we have ministry booths for you to go and take that form with you. So you don't need to bring it up here, but we're going to sign up for volunteering up at the altar because I believe it's a spiritual commitment that we're going to make. And then we're going to, again, go out with that sheet of paper in a little while uh, at the end of service and give it to someone at one of those booths and get involved right now. Check out this next verse. It says this. Oh, by the way, because you've been honoring God and obeying God at all of our campuses, this last week we had over 4,500 pairs of shoes given to those in need. Wow. 4,500. That is some crazy, unselfie people. Thank you. It's incredible what God can do through his people when we get involved. Look at this. It says in verse 31, Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? Apparently God is planning on us taking on things larger than ourselves. Based upon this verse. It goes on to say, And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Whoa. That's a big line. Does that mean I literally have to give away everything? No, it means that you, you should not have anything, that, you should not own anything that owns you. We talked about that last week. I don't want to go into that again, but I do want to say this. You know one of the biggest things that you own is your time. Are you giving a portion of your time to God as much as you're giving a portion of your income to God? We should be giving some of our time to God. Now, some of you are like, man, you don't know how busy I am. It's crazy. I do know how busy you are. I promise you, I don't know. I, I, I don't mean it's ugly, and I don't mean arrogant, but I doubt there's someone in here busier than me. You may be. You may be right neck and neck with me, and you may be a little past me, but if I can serve, so can you. We can all serve. How many of you guys feel that way, too? That you're busy like that. You're crazy busy. I am, too. I totally get it. My life is insanely crazy. I'm going here. I'm going there duh, 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 all the time, but I still want to make time to serve, to make a difference, you can do it too. So this is critical. Look at Ecclesiastes 11 verse 4 says this, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. Boom, drop the mic. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? If you're waiting for perfect conditions, you're never getting anything done. You know, if you're waiting, it's like when you go to Luby's, you ever, anyone like Luby's? I love Luby's. It's God's waiting room. Anyways, when you go to Luby's, <laughs> you get it in a second. When you go to Luby's and you got your tray and you're in line and you go through, they say, would you like some jello? Oh, no, I'm going to pass. I'm going to pass. And you go to the next one. Would you like some you know, this or that? No, I'm good. I'm waiting for the Salisbury steak. It's really good. And you keep going. And you get it. And you, oh, do you want some? No, I'm going to wait. And then you get to it and you're like, oh, it doesn't look as good today. Okay, I'll wait for the fish. And you wait and you get the fish. Oh, no. I'm still, I'm gonna, oh, I kind of wanted that back there. But you get all the way to the end and guess what? You have nothing on your tray. And if you never commit to anything in your life, like serving, you're going to get to the end of your life and realize my life is empty. My life is empty. 
why are we so scared of commitment? It's crazy. This isn't even a big commitment. It's a simple commitment, but it's a big deal for changing people's lives. You can make a difference. Well, but I, I, I'm busy. I don't have time. I mean, you know, here's the thing. I just started dating this guy or girl, and, you know, we're getting pretty serious, and so we're going to be busy planning a wedding. So as soon as we get married, then after that, you know, I'll be glad to serve. And, well, but I don't know if this is the first year of our marriage. We're trying to adjust to being married and all this stuff, and so I don't know if we're ready for that. And so, I mean, oh, we just got pregnant, you know, and now we've got to get ready for having a baby and all that stuff. So I just don't have time to serve right now. Oh, no, we have a little toddler in the house now, and you know how there's a toddler. We're so busy. There's just no way we could possibly serve. Oh, I mean, how can we possibly serve? Now that our kids in elementary school, and we've got piano practice, and we've got, you know, little league, and we've got all these things going on. There's there's no way we can possibly make time. Oh, I mean, how in the world can I possibly make time to serve? Because my kids are in junior high and high school, and you know, we got club volleyball now, and soccer, and we got drill team, and we got cheerleading, and football. I mean, how can we possibly booster club, all this kind of stuff? There's just no way I could possibly serve. I mean, how can we serve? We got to take on a second job so that we can, you know, get some extra money so we can send our kids to college. And, you know, how can we possibly serve now that our kids are finished with college and we're having to take care of our parents now and we're so busy with all that? How can we possibly serve as we enter our retirement years because we're just tired and there should be other young people that can do that? And you literally excuse yourself out of serving your entire life. Oh, it got quiet. God is speaking today to you and I through his word that it's time to put up or shut up. Right? It's his word. God wants us to serve. So here's my challenge at every campus right now. I'm going to invite every campus pastor and all the teams required to do this to come out and put sheets all along this stage and at the platform at all of our campuses right now. They can come on out, and we're going to put them all along the front here. And if you guys will spread those out also to the side, side stages as well. At all campuses, we're doing this right now. And here is my challenge for you. A friend of mine told me this just a few moments ago. A friend of mine said to me, you can fake caring, but you can't fake showing up. True, isn't it? Here's my challenge for you. Number three, walk up and sign up now. Walk up and sign up now. Remove excusitis. Excusitis is a terrible disease. Quit giving yourself excuses as to why you're not going to honor God. Thank you. These people are getting up already. Walk up right now. I believe God wants us to do this right now. I don't see you moving yet. 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 You say you sound like a broken record. I don't see you moving yet. I don't see you moving. It's a remix. I don't see you moving yet. I don't see you moving yet. I don't see you moving yet. God is saying it's time. It's time to commit to God's house, to serve, to make a difference. I'm going to put my name down here. You can count on me, Pastor. You can count on me to make a difference. You know why? You say, Pastor, why are you getting in our faces like this? Why are you being so hardcore for the whole series? Let me tell you why. Because we're trying to change the world. And the only way to do that is to have you get beyond yourself, take the lens off of yourself, and put the lens on the world, put the lens on others, and making a difference. And that's how we're going to change the world. That's how we're going to do it. It's because you sign up. You get involved. You realize God is drafting you into his army. God wants you to be involved. He wants you to make a difference. Now's the time. Now's the time. This is happening at all of our campuses, every single one of our campuses. You are needed. Oh, but it's a big campus. They don't really need me. Yes, we do. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. If you believe that you are not needed here, that is crazy. You are needed here. And some of you are at smaller campuses. Oh, I'm not needed here. I see people around. You are smoking something that you don't think you're needed. You are crazy. You are needed at your campus. Whatever campus you're at, you are needed. And I want to challenge you to become needed and known. To be known by others is to be needed by them and be plugged in and making a difference. People say, I don't really know anyone at the church. Guess how you learn to know people? By serving alongside others. That's how you meet people. That's how you get connected. And when you begin to do that, that's what, how God changes life. My sister is in this service right now. And guess where she met her husband? Serving the Lord in children's ministry. Surprise, surprise. And you know what? She found an amazing, godly, single guy. They do exist on the planet, but they're all serving. That's why you don't see him right now. They're serving God somewhere. I want to challenge you to begin to serve and to begin to make a difference. Once your name is down, you can go back to your seat. Let's give these people a hand for signing up to serve at all of our campuses. Let's give them a hand. You can make a difference. As you go back to your seat, please fill out that form. In just a minute, we're finishing services early today, so we can, we're going to be dismissing by whatever ministry you want to be involved in, okay? And so we are trying to change the world. Guys, I cannot stress this enough. We are here to impact lives, and that takes a lot more than we have now. And so thank you. Sincerely thank you for giving your time and your energy. Do you know there's people right now that work two and three services so that you don't, because you're not working one? 
Did you know that? That's crazy. Not only is that crazy, frankly, it's just downright not fair. So we should all be at least working one service. This is why every campus has at least more than one service, so you can go to one, serve at one. Serve at one, go to one. And so whatever order you want to do that, that's why we do that, so that you can be involved and make a difference as well as having a difference made in your life too. You have no idea the difference that you're making right now by signing up. We're going to bow our heads and pray right now. You guys keep coming forward. It's okay. Don't stop during this prayer time. But as you come forward at every campus, if everyone else will just bow their heads. And please don't judge a person that's still sitting down. They may already be serving. That's why they're not up right now. Okay? But if you know you're sitting there and you're not serving, I believe God is speaking to you to step up and get up. And it's not too late. You can still get up and come forward and sign up right now. Some of you are dating someone. You're like, you know what? We need to set, start this relationship right. And we're going to start by serving God together. Praise God. Wonderful idea. You know how you can improve your marriage? Start serving and get your fo focus off each other's problems and on to changing someone else's life. You have no idea the difference that you can make today. Every head bowed, every eye closed, let's just take a moment to pray. I want to challenge you today. Maybe God's speaking to you saying it's time for you to get a servant-minded attitude. If that's you today, and you know the Lord's speaking to you saying it's time for you to think about others instead of complaining about work, say, God, thank you for my job. There's many people who don't have work right now. Thank you for my job. Help me to go serve my boss, serve my coworkers, serve the customer this week. Maybe instead of complaining about your spouse, you say, God, help me to serve my spouse this week. Game changer. Major game changer serve. Every head bowed, every closed. If that's your prayer today, to say, Lord, I want to be a servant. You would just slip your hand in the air today if that's you. You say, I know you're speaking to me today, God, and I know I need to be a servant-minded person. I know you're causing me to get my eyes off of myself and on to others. Help me not to be so selfie. Help me to be unselfie. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Thank you. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he served you and I unto his own death. Wow. He knew we needed a Savior, and He gave His life for us. He served our need by dying for us. And He rose again from the grave, proving that He's God. Now He waits for you and me to individually receive Him. Right now, at every campus, you can pray this prayer and receive Christ. You can pray this with me. You can say, Dear Jesus, I believe You died on the cross for me. You served me unto death. And I believe You rose again from the grave, proving that You're God. And I ask You, I invite You to come into my heart, come into my life, Change me from within now. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. I now want to be a living, breathing servant for you from this day forward. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In your name we pray. Amen. Isn't God good? I'm fired up, man. I'm fired up.